Well, welcome to the 2021 Lane Lab Lecture Series. Um, I'm leading an inaugural studio this spring that frames a UVA satellite site in Milton Airfield as a mesocosm for ways of knowing through situated making, where students research, design, and build a mesocosm investigation um, to then challenge, interrogate, and potentially kind of reorient through a series of exercises that explore alternative ways of knowing and creating knowledge. And then so in tandem to this studio is, is this lecture, um, which is a parallel effort in positioning the studio's activities on site within a history of sort of precedence in, in theory and practice. And so today marks a transition both from kind of the designer centric speakers um, that we've had, as well as kind of from our local Piedmont eco, eco region, sort of geographically speaking, um, as the studio itself has recently sort of begun, a, begun reading Robin Kimmerer's call for mutualism between scientific ecological knowledge and traditional eco ecological knowledge. And we've also just recently gotten back from a sister research landscape, uh, the Blandy Experimental Farm. And so additionally, our guest speaker today uh, will be taking us to the Arctic um, and presenting on landscape rewilding as a vehicle to realize indigenous and community rights in battle climate change. And so Dr. Tara Mustanen, um, he's a passionate defender of traditional worldview and cosmology of his people, um, and head of the village of Selkia, North Karelia in Finland. He has worked as the traditional knowledge coordinator for Eurasia for the Arctic Biodiversity Assessment. Uh, professionally, he works for the award-winning Snow Change Cooperative, um, which is a nonprofit organization based in Finland with members across the Arctic, including the communities of um, Eastern Sami, um, even Inuit, and, and many more. And Mustanen is a, a well-known scholar of Arctic biodiversity, climate change, and indigenous issues, having published over a dozen publications on the topics, including the groundbreaking Eastern Sami Atlas and Snowscapes Dreamscapes. Mustanen has also wore, won several human rights and environment awards for um, the work with snow change um, in indigenous peoples of the Arctic. So please join me in welcoming Tara Mustanen. And well, Matthew, uh, thank you and, and uh, all of you who are there and joined in today. Uh, a warm welcome from the evening or should I say from the future. Um, mm -hmm. That's the time machine of Zooming when we can try to connect across time zones. And, and um, I was... Um, asked to come and speak to you virtually here from the village of Selkie, uh, uh, which is here in the eastern part of Finland. It's about 50 kilometers to the Russian border. And if you want to think about the no northern location, we are at 62 latitude north, which is, uh, which is not in the high Arctic, it, it's in the boreal, but I will talk about the Arctic as well as part of our work in the snow change co-op and, and uh, the kind of things that uh, Matthew was asking um, us guest presenters to bring to you today. What I will have for you is about eight or nine quick slides on the kind of work we do on the, <clears throat> on the landscapes and trying to think about the profound questions of climate change, um, biodiversity, traditional and indigenous knowledge issues and how are we to try to find new solutions to those. But I really want to say <clears throat> time and um, space for potential questions or uh, inquiries or anything you, you might want to know. Um, before we go to the actual presentation, I, I would like to make it um, known that the question of indigenous peoples in this part of the world is rather unique. Um, the Finnish peoples who are the main population of Finland speak a language that belongs into finno ukric non-indigenous languages. However, in our constitution, it's the Sami people uh, who are the indigenous peoples by law. Now, what makes things interesting and complex between these ethnic groups is that we share a, a linguistic connection. For example, when we say we come from Suomi, meaning we come from Finland, the Sami will say we come from Sapmi. And the um, many of the place names or 
concepts of nature, for example, a lake will be in Saami Jauri and in Finnish Järvi. And that's why the socio-historical context of what happened follows in some pathways the uh, big story that you, I'm sure you have heard on uh, equity and injustices against the indigenous peoples um, where colonization has happened and so on and so on. That's partly true also in Finland. But what makes the story complex is that the group of linguistic nations here, the Finns, Karelians, Veps, Komi, Nenets and the Sami belong into this non-Indo-European matrix of um, cultures stretching from Western Urals all the way to here. And uh, that's why I hope that today's presentation will be an exciting one for you and you will take a journey, albeit a virtual journey, into a uh, less known region globally. And, and with those caveats, let's go uh, straight into the business. So uh, Matthew, please, the second slide. <coughs> a few words about our organization. Who are we and what's going on? Um, as Matthew was saying, Snow Change is kind of the host organization for what we do. It was founded in 2000. So we are often called a mature organization or we have been around almost a quarter of a century. We just celebra celebrated last year our 20th anniversary since founding. And now it's the 21st um, year of operations. Now, having been doing a lot of these kind of environmental and landscape and other studies and collaborations with many indigenous peoples also in Alaska and lower 48, we have quite much work in in North America, both in Canada and in the US with the tribes and, and uh, indigenous communities. Maybe at 2017, we started to think, given all that was going on, what can we do as a community-based organization and network of indigenous and local villages to respond <clears throat> in an orderly fashion to the profound challenges that we face? Mainly I'm talking about here, the questions of loss of biodiversity, uh, non-existent rights for communities that will face mining companies, large scale logging activities, and also biodiversity losses. And that's why we came up and joined forces with the European Union um, entity called European Investment Bank uh, back in 2017 to come up with something called Landscape Rewilding Program. And that's what I will bring to you today, the main message is about. What's maybe relevant for you to know in the landscape rewilding program that we do, or no matter how we call it, working on landscapes, trying to nurture them back into health, is that we are one of the only units in Europe that's actually embracing indigenous and traditional knowledge of the villages with the latest science to reestablish um, connectivity and widespread action on landscapes in the boreal and high or in the Arctic uh, for, for these kind of steps forwards. And this has also included the very first indigenous and community conserved areas in Finland. I'll talk about that a bit later. It's, it's a concept that um, US scholars and students know there's million acronyms out there. This one is called ICCA. And what it really uh, has behind this concept is a notion that villages can maintain landscapes. Villages and indigenous communities are often um, the, the gate, uh, shall we say, the safeguarding a lot of the remaining biodiversity that we have still on the planet in terms of natural systems. I saw a figure of 80% of the remaining, remaining terrestrial biodiversity being safeguarded or being located in the indigenous homelands globally. That's why the United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP, came up maybe a decade ago with the concept of ICCA. It's a formal UN recognition of a site or a system or ecological uh, functioning landscape that, that's safeguarded and, and governed by the indigenous or local community 
using their cultural heritage and land uses. So it's a kind of a new step in the in the category of uh, conservation. The reason why I would bring it, bring this up to your to, uh, your group here today <clears throat> can be maybe understood in the U.S. context by thinking about Yellowstone, which is your one of your large iconic parks, national parks, actually the first one that was ever founded. Now, if you trace back why Yellowstone was founded and how, you will suddenly discover quickly that the traditional land uses of Shoshone and some of the other indigenous peoples were ignored and they were actually, for the lack of a better word, kicked out of the park space and then this national park came into being. So despite the good actions uh, from conservation and trying to protect nature, there's a colonial history also there, where a lot of the indigenous or local communities have been affected by top-down way of managing landscapes, whether it's for use or conservation. Another internationally relevant example often has been call, called to be uh, the large parks over there in Africa. For example, in Kenya, Masai Mara or Serengeti, that used to be the uh, nomadic roots and landscapes of the Maasai indigenous peoples who are still there today. But the parks that were founded by British and other colonial uh, parties about 100 years ago, or I don't, I don't recall the exact year, but during the colonial time when Kenya was part of the British Empire, of course, led to the evic eviction and, and uh, loss of land rights for the Maasai. And that's why the this concept of community conserved areas in landscapes that we have then pioneered in Finland um, is one of those perhaps softer tools or, or um, actions that we can take to alleviate both the historical equity issues in conservation and still try to deliver on high, high demand targets for conservation of species, landscapes, ecosystems, and, and uh, even carbon, carbon storages. So that's just some of the kind of a theoretical or concept background of what I will talk, talk to you about today and why. Next one, please. So <clears throat> again, I have only a few slides, but I wanted to show you the ones that matter. Um, this is our first site, something that was our very first site in, in the landscape rewilding as a pilot area back in 2012, even though the whole program started in 2017. Um, <clears throat> this is a specific site actually in our own village that uh, I hope will capture some of the elements of the work we tried to do. Now, before I launch into any kind of a pitch of what actually happened, how do we look at rewilding and, and uh, what's going on there? So the concept of rewilding could be defined in many ways. Here in Europe, it started maybe in 1990s as um, an ecological movement to try to install large herbivores back in landscapes and bring back some of the close to extinction um, animals like uh, European bison or wild horses back into the landscape. <clears throat> now, especially following the Perino paper in science in 2019, we can now look at rewilding as a very exciting mainstream restoration uh, for landscapes. Here, when I talk about the rewilding actions, I'm mainly talking about um, mechanisms that try to start natural successions on landscapes, natural cycles of living, natural um, um, steps in, for example, boreal forests or wetlands or lakes or rivers that have been affected by human uh, damages and land use. While there might be some early human interventions, we are also looking at the case where we trust nature, especially in the context of embracing traditional knowledge and and or indigenous knowledge in term, terms of monitoring and for the lack of better concept, uh, trusting nature to come back on its own uh, <clears throat> terms. Before I go further, I'll just say one more thing. And that has to do with the fact that 
the re these rewilding sites are on their third life, for the lack of a better term. Back in the day after the Ice Age and all the way to 1800s, many of these sites and 1900s here were uh, ecosystems that were on low pressure. Maybe communities were hunting there, fishing there, utilizing these areas for berry picking or other seasonal round activities in the boreal, but their characteristics and, and the way they functioned was relatively stable. And then in many of our sites, as you will see, industrial land use happened. So essentially the dynamics of what that place was were maimed and destroyed um, by all sorts of industrial or other human uses. And now, depending on the site, when we are trying to rewild and restore them back into health, that constitutes what I mean by third life. And it becomes a very exciting journey of what that may entail. And what comes back, how, what, what implications does it have for science and also for the traditional culture and deeper layers of indigenous and traditional knowledge. Now let's look at this picture quickly. <clears throat> the first site that we have um, been working on in 2012 photo on the left hand side, you can see the very first um, actions that we took on a peat mining site. This land use form is an industrial mining that strips away the peat layers of a uh, marsh mire or bog. And after 25 years of industrial use, the, the site was then converted back into health, or at least we were trying to start the rewilding of this site essentially from a moonscape. If you want to look at the, um, how the site was looking before anything was done, you can see hopefully in the photo in the right hand side in the, towards the horizon, these brown strips of peat mining um, <clears throat> actions. And that's, the, that's how the whole site was looking like before we started to work on those three large pools of wetland that you can see in this uh, 2012 photo. Now, eight years have passed. The overall size of this area is about 180 hectares. Now, please pardon my inability to convert that into North American context, but I, I would believe it's about 600 acres or 700 acres, something in that range. Um, but uh, Matthew can correct me later for my mistakes. Um, this is how the site looks last year, 2020. All the pools have been expanded. It's now covering up to about 170 hectares of fully restored area. <clears throat> and what can we say about the comeback and, and uh, indicators of success or failure of rewilding? Let's look at the fellow on the right hand photo because it's springtime and a lot of these wonderful birds are coming up here again. Uh, this is a photo of long-billed dewwitcher, a very rare wading bird that was then, um, or he actually came last year to Linnunsuo on, onto this side. This was probably the seventh time this bird was ever seen in Finland. It's a very rare birder, bird for our uh, latitude and, and location. And equally so, Derek Sandpiper and some of the other very rare waders have been documented on the site. So we can try to deduct some of the success of landscape rewilding based on what, who comes back and how do we track those species and whether nature is accepting, especially the very rare or demanding um, mammals, birds, insects, pollinators, or others, the, the, these sites. Now, in terms of quantifying, if we look at the data from 2012 to here, uh, when this site was a moonscape after the peat mining, it was utilized by two bird species, a raven, common raven, and then black grouse for the spring mating season um, and, and so on. Now, to our greatest surprise, we are up to 195 species in eight years when you think of the Finnish boreal and Arctic to have overall roughly 360 to 400 bird species that might wander or occupy this land. So over or about one half of those species have either nested, 
utilized or being monitored on this site. In terms of scientific monitoring on landscapes and how they are recovering, one of the species we are looking at is wood sandpiper and northern pintail. These are not extremely rare species, but they are more to do with breeding sexes and, and more on the, shall we say, generalist species. And we can then try to deduct also quantifying sexes, not only the uh, coming forwards of very rare species. Next one, please. This is a very quick overview. I won't go into large details, um, but this map on the left hand side is just for you to see what kind of a country Finland is and to see the numbers on the map where you can deduct that the um, um, where our sites of the landscape rewilding program nationally are. Currently, we are looking at about 25, 26 sites that have been included, including large river basins. And I'll talk about the scale of landscape rewilding in a bit or in, in the next uh, few points. But just to give you the numbers, currently Snow Change, who's running this program, owns physically about, okay, and how many acres would that be? Maybe it's about 4,000 or 5,000 acres spread over these 25 sites. Uh, and then we are using land concession program, which can um, work with the local landowners or municipalities or the state authorities. And then we are up to uh, currently at 25,000 hectares, which implies about 75,000 acres of sites. This number is actually more, but the, we are using these conservative numbers to make sure that we don't boast or we don't tell more than the exact measure, measured impacts on what we do. A lot of our sites are peatlands that are recovering, like the one on the right hand side on the photo. But the, this, this slide here is just to um, design for you to have a sense of the scale and, and the landscapes and where they are on the national map. Next one, please. So what are we doing in terms of landscapes and how do we look at either the elements of landscape planning and rewilding, or can we look into whole action spreading across the visible landscape? I'll start because this is a zoom to America and everything over there is usually, of course, grandiose and large. I'll start with our largest single site. This is a Kivisuo and it was, a, um, it joined our program last year, maybe about exactly one year ago, about 11 months ago. Uh, it's located in the subarctic, close to the village uh, or town of Oulu. Uh, it's not over in Lapland, but it's very close to that border from the national viewpoint. And uh, the overall territory of this peatland and forest, old growth forest ecosystem is about 614 hectares. And I would believe that's about over uh, 2,000 acres, maybe close to 3,000. Now, what's going on here is that um, this particular site that has the name Kivisuo, if you translate that from Finnish into English, it means a peatland of stones or large rocks. So you can deduct some of the ecological information also from the place names. Excuse me. Uh, was in the open markets. It was floating in the marketplace as a site and uh, it was threatened by industrial land use, forestry, ditching programs, potential peat mining harvests. And, and uh, even though there was some human influence on the site, some early ditches from 1960s for forestry purposes, um, you can see in the aerial view that the overall site on the left hand side uh, still retains a large amount of characteristics that are natural. And the site is so big that it can maintain critically important biodiversity, including highly endangered peregrine falcon, which is one of the apex falcons in Finland. And between 1940s and 1990s, uh, the peregrine falcon habitats were lost in Finland, or there was a large program of industrial land use, I can talk about that later, but 
the end result being that a lot of these important bird species were lost. And that's why the uh, uh, Kivisuo plays a big role as a part of a large peatland eco ecological hotspot, uh, both in terms of carbon that's stored there and also the, the uh, <clears throat> species that it maintains and also flood control, natural flood control and water quality. Now, one of the things we tried to do here was then to work with the government of Finland uh, to formally protect this area. And subsequently, it actually became the largest protected area in Finland in 2020, last year. It's equally in size than our smallest national parks. And that's why, of course, here we can demonstrate an action that was trying to secure and rewild and restore and maintain a whole landscape system. So I wanted to bring you this forwards to indicate how action on the whole landscape wide um, uh, pathway can be taken and how many critically important uh, simultaneous values can be gained when you take action on, on the northern ecosystems, uh, including also the fact that about one third of world's soil-based carbon is trapped in the northern peatlands. And of course, here I'm talking also about, also about Siberia, Canadian North, Alaska, uh, as well as um, Scandinavia and Finland, Northwest Russia here. So maybe some of you will find it uh, exciting or interesting that actually in the Northern peatlands and Northern ecosystems, there is at least the same amount of carbon that's currently uh, going through the rainforests, like in Brazil and Amazonia and other places. So the North, <laughs> <clears throat> These northern uh, sites matter a lot on number of scales. They are very important for the local communities and indigenous communities. They store and maintain huge amounts of carbon and they are critically important for the planetary ecology, such as the peregrine falcon uh, as nesting areas and breeding areas because of the flyway. A lot of the uh, birds that have been in the south for the winter are now on their way back. Um, just today, we saw the very first cranes and lapwings that uh, are like old friends when we see them after the long winter and heavy, heavy snow here. Next one, please. So this is just to give you some of the, shall we say, collage of kind of actions that we take. On the left hand side, you can see our teams working on a river system, trying to restore spawning gravel and uh, habitats for trout, grayling, and so some of the other salmonid species. In the middle, you can see a boreal wetland that we have made in small scale that uh, creates, this is all man made, but it's, we are uh, trying to look at landscape values and making a water protect, protection wetland that's also functioning as a small scale biodiversity hotspot, as you can see on the uh, cheeks of the golden eye that were produced by this small wetland. And then on the right hand side, you can see two twin actions, uh, maybe like a gradient of what we do. As I said before, sometimes we have to bring in the diggers and large heavy equipment if, it, if it's a moonscape. If there are no ecological values left other than just the landscape itself of, of industrial land use, then we may have to use heavy equipment to recreate wetlands or um, restart the natural succession on many sites, carbon capture and so on and so on using wetlands or whatever the case. Or, and let's pause here for a moment. This is a view from the Sami indigenous forests that um, we are working with them on from the high Arctic with the de uh, dead timber on the right hand side photo. And <clears throat> uh, the reason why I wanted to bring this one up for you is to point to the concept of using indigenous knowledge as a methodological action on re rewilding northern landscapes. Mainly I'm talking here about the decaying timber Unlike the boreal forest, the high Arctic or the 
shall we say northern boreal forests, will take centuries to come back after industrial land use. And the critically important, just like in your temperate forests there in Virginia and, and the eastern part of the US woodlands, it's actually the decaying timber on the forest floor that's the engine for a lot of the insect life, the way carbon travels, and the whole natural succession. Using this dead timber on the landscapes in the Sami forests in the last photo here, we are taking a century view. We are allowing this uh, pine log and these pine trees to decompose on their own speed on the landscape using uh, knowledge from the Sami elders and guidance from the indigenous knowledge to take their time to restart the natural succession or cycles in the uh, Sami forest as a vehicle for, for trying to restore that specific affected forest lot back into health. So what you can see in these photos is essentially a gradient of very heavy biomanipulation starting from reintroduction of gravel and use of shovels and machines to recreate habitats like the guys on the left hand side, uh, trying to restore landscape values like the wetland in the middle that seem to be accepted by nature also as a uh, as vehicles and sites for biodiversity and ultimately then the twin actions one using diggers and caterpillars to work on very heavily damaged sites to start natural succession or using the indigenous wisdom and knowledges to then uh, take the slow view thinking seven generations or or hundreds of years to the future, how this forest will come back on its own terms. Next one, please. <clears throat> now, continuing on that scale of the toolbox, this is another view of small landscape rewilding actions. <clears throat> Trying to um, help and stimulate river comeback in terms of water health, pollution and organic loading by working with the local landowners to create small wetlands, small rewilding actions in the landscape that look good, or at least they are designed to be replicating and starting to uh, bring back the natural um, forms and, and uh, functions of a landscape. So this one is a small four hectare wetland we have uh, recreated uh, on land concession land just to give you the scale, to, some thoughts about the scale of how we work, ranging from whole landscape actions into this kind of a uh, smaller tools in the toolkit of what we try to do. Next one, please. We are almost at the end, but there are a couple of points that I wanted to bring to you then on the world of science and <clears throat> climate action, because that's of course, as President Biden has, has informed us over the past few months, um, one of the most critically important issues for all of humanity at this hour. And that's why, of course, if we are sitting on massive carbon storages and are in a position here in the boreal and in the Arctic to do something about that, um, how are we trying to understand and measure success and what are we doing? So in summary form, we are trying to look at all of our landscapes in terms of uh, deducting how much carbon dioxide they are trapping and when natural succession and shall we say breathing or photosynthesis happens on our sites, how much methane, which is also a potent greenhouse gas is being released. Now the way to deduct that uh, and to actually precisely measure per hectare or acre what's going on requires some fancy science. And that's why we have combined satellite surveys, vegetation surveys, drone footage, and ultimately trace gas analyzers uh, to try to measure whether we are succeeding. I'm happy to inform you that all of the sites that we currently have in our landscape rewilding program are carbon sinks and they are carbon storage sites. So we have been able to convert or maintain massively and critically important uh, carbon storages on the ground that will alleviate also the impacts of, of climate change and are part of the solution. 
So what can we say about the, the um, greenhouse gas and climate file in terms of landscape rewilding? Three points which are, which are ge uh, generally true all across the north is that rewilding may alleviate soil-based emissions day one. Meaning that if we are doing things well and uh, we adhere to a good design and, and understanding of a peatland or forest or whatever the site, we can stop the active uh, emissions emanating from the soil because of the industrial land use on day one. And that can be up to 900,000 kilos on, on a 100 hectare site per year. So equaling about 900 tons per year of emissions that we, we are able to stop immediately. Secondly, rewilding, if we trust nature, if we follow the, the succession and monitor and do our things well, it may start natural carbon sinks and, and uh, storage um, again meaning that our sites are trapping carbon dioxide from the atmosphere actively. And this could be categorized. You, some of you may have heard the uh, <clears throat> concept of a nature-based solution. So this might uh, qualify into that. Now, in my scientific work, I'm currently the lead author for the IPCC AR6, which is the assessment report number six, that will inform then national governments next year about what science will talk about in terms of where climate change is. And of course, this will be part of our package most like, likely to try to advance the concept of landscape action and uh, nature-based solutions. Finally, what we are doing in the Arctic is to try to maintain carbon on the ground. And this is a tricky part. I won't go into that. You can ask about it if you want in the questions, but I'll just tell you that some of the Arctic carbon storages, especially the permafrost or permanently frozen soils in Alaska, Siberia and Canada are thawing. And even though Finland doesn't have a permafrost um, as a landscape, then we are faced with a very profound question. How are we to address this very uh, sophisticated and nasty feedback loop that's going on in the uh, Siberian, Alaskan and Canadian permafrost areas, Greenland. One of the things we can try to do is to work with those parts of the north where we can restart um, and keep carbon on the ground and restart the natural succession. So those are the kind of things that we are uh, contemplating in scale. Next one, please. And here we come to the end. This is just to um, give you the last point on landscapes. Um, when we look at how fragmented and how destroyed, for example, the Finnish boreal and, and uh, uh, South boreal ecosystems are because of the land use that we have had here, it's been very intense. To give you the numbers, it's about 91 to 95% of natural forests have been lost south of the Arctic Circle in Finland. So it means that 90% of our landscapes have been damaged one way or the other by human activities. Now on the map, you can see two green spots, one on the left and one in the, uh, shall we say, upper corner. And there's a red arrow connecting those two sides. The story here, I won't go into a long narrative, but I'll just point out one landscape action that might be fitting also in the US context or in your particular studies. Those green spots are conservation areas that have been formally established. The other one on the left hand is quite large. It's about 1,200 acres or 1,500 acres. And, and uh, then the one in the north, the green spot is also a very important forest area. However, nothing connects those two. They are like islands or archipelago of isolated conservation sites. How can we assist and help in doing landscape work by strategically uh, using our small funds or actions to um, create something more than the value of its parts if we are doing our work? Well, the solution in this case was an ecological corridor 
that we were able to uh, create between two existing conservation sites on landscape. By strategically purchasing some of the rewilding sites or lands that then became part of the landscape rewilding program, we were able to recreate an important ecological corridor. And now those two sites are connected and the added value of that conservation area is now more than having only those isolated and essentially um, almost like archipelago style uh, pro protected areas. And there, my last point to you is that, um, before I'll stop, is that when you look at this map and when you look at the challenge ahead of us, no matter where we are, whether we are in China, Nigeria, India, in Finland or, or the US, is that we have to reconceptualize land, landscapes in our minds and in our actions completely in a new way if we are to survive this century. And we have to be smart, we have to be doing new things and ultimately also embrace unexpected sources of knowledges. And even though I wasn't talking about to you on a long lecture of what traditional knowledge or indigenous knowledge implies, I hope that some of you were paying attention when I was talking about that old dead timber on the Sami forest. And what the Sami people, for example, are putting forward in terms of a way of changing our view on the landscape is the long time span. Okay, so some of those decaying timber are put today into those landscapes to start to uh, heal and, and come back to life over centuries. So we are planning actions for 2300 AD on some of our sites. That's the kind of the long view we have to take both on spatial, as you can see in front of you, recreation of ecological corridors, interconnected ecological sites, which are allowed then to recover, as well as core ecological areas. And then also in temporal scales that don't follow a four year election cycle or six years of a project cycle. And isn't that the challenge? So we ultimately have to break away from our little boxes of fear and the sectoral thinking and to embrace completely different maps and completely different compasses um, in our minds to come to, to this place of uh, landscape rewilding if we are truly to take action for the planet. Thank you for your time and I'm very happy to take any questions that you might have. And Matthew, you can close down the PowerPoint. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Tara. Um, yeah, any questions or comments from the group? I have a question. Thank you so much. That was a really amazing lecture and very inspiring work. And I'm, I'm wondering um, if you have any insight or advice that you would be, be willing to share about how kind of more inherently fragmented landscapes, for example, that we find in urban areas or, you know, in Charlottesville, it's a very suburban area. Um, and ultimately we'd want to work on a large scale, but if for the meantime, we're stuck with these small sites, is there a way that we can work with them to support larger rewilding efforts? Is it helpful to try and create like, you know, spots for biodiversity in an urban area or is that actually not could that cause more problems is that unethical um is it better to focus on like human needs like food production in these areas uh just any advice if you have it on like how to work on those types of spaces well lizzie thank you for that question and and uh, let me first say that the uh, I'm not a person that can answer all, all the urban troubles. Um, there's no easy yes or no answers here. Um, let's start from what, what is a human being and how do you thrive in your environments? If you are in an urban area, you still need the green. You need those spaces and you need um, physically the need to feel plants, trees and, and uh, associated animal life. 
Secondly, there's a surprising amount of animal life and, and uh, ecological diversity today in cities, especially at nighttime. I saw some place, or when I have been, for example, in Vancouver, because of our work, that's, that's a large Western North American city, you can find um, raccoon dogs, coyote, um, even, even a, a mountain lion that comes to the suburb of Vancouver. Vancouver. So our notions of uh, cities being somehow devoid of life or species is of course completely wrong. We don't just see that life. So that's one of the things we can change, which is our per perception. Cities are not isolated. Of course, they are more devoid of life than old growth forest or highly functioning wetland, but they are still um, uh, our home. And uh, that's why the, the any action that we can take that tackles on a number of points on a list, reestablishes food security, urban gardening. Uh, I have seen incredible pictures of, uh, and you would be the experts here on, was it in Singapore where whole, whole buildings have been converted into green spaces on the outside and inside and on the top um, and so on and so on. If you look at the traditional landscape archi architecture in India, um, dating back hundreds of years, you will find how they have tried to find peace between this very profound question that you are asking, how do we combine large human settlements and um, natural solutions? So any green spot is always better than not having that green spot. Um, at the same time, let's be, a mom for the moment's sake, a little bit cynical. Um, if you have a tree or a set of trees in an otherwise concrete jungle or surrounded by completely um, modified environments, they may have an inherent value for their lifespan, but let's be also clear, it's not a surviving ecosystem on the long term. In fact, many of the trees in, in, in cities are suffering from continuous um, um, electric lights that are all on constantly, the concrete that paves away over their roots and so on and so on. So there's a couple of researchers that have demonstrated how there's a great level of stress with the, some trees in urban areas. So, but that's what we have and we have to always think about that local context of where we are. It's never in vain. So I would encourage you to do all that you can and go outside every single time you can. But of course, the, the ultimate answer to your question is that the, on planetary ecology and landscapes, uh, we have to do something in scale. And I'm often nowadays thinking about my very first trip to the US back in 1994, seems like a hundred years ago, but the, at least 20 kilos ago, but the, I was working as a wilderness guide in boundary waters in Northern Minnesota at the border between um, Minnesota and, and uh, Canada. And uh, there's a boundary waters um, uh, conservation area that's in scale enough to maintain a real old growth forest. I think it's about 2 million acres or something to that fashion. And herein lies the solution. We can't and we don't have to tear down the cities and we, we are not wrong. It's not wrong to live in the city, but the city will require better landscapes, more functioning landscapes and more healthy landscapes simply for pollinators, food security. Where will the city get, get its water if, if everything is polluted? Think about Flint and Michigan. So um, it's not a question of, in my mind, about yes or no, it's a question of scale. And then one old fisherman here in Finland, Pente Linkola, told me one time that each tree has inherent value. And that's a good guidance. Every squirrel, every owl, every raccoon dog, every tree has an inherent value. They are not wrong. And you are not wrong, Lizzie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I have a question, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, I'm not 
officially part of this studio. I have a different studio that I'm in right now, but I was really happy to jump in on this talk. Um, thank you so much for, for presenting, sharing your knowledge with us today. Um, I was really taken with your description of the really long-term vision of these sort of projects. Um, I was just thinking about this in relation to my studio project um, in an estuary on the Virginia coast. We we're thinking about climate change and restoration and um, how to integrate, you know, urban areas with um, increased ecological value. And I'm so curious if you have any any words to share about um, how you how you propose those really long term visions for for projects when people are really interested in kind of immediate results or like election cycles and politics. Um, how do you how do you start those conversations? Yeah, thanks, Sarai. Um, I'm happy the easy questions come first, which is of course a joke to say that these are one of the most profound questions of our time. How do we think about the wetland that will be there in a hundred years when we don't even seem to be going through a year without a ma major hurricane, catastrophe, earthquake or whatever there. And, and of course there, therein lies the answer. Um, we don't have to know and we can't know even in the ipcc which is the most as we were told it's very arrogant over there um, it's the most powerful scientific understanding of climate change on the planet and and uh, so on no matter what the scenarios are how many temperature points or how many parts per millimeter co2 is going up the fact remains that we don't know and the future remains unwritten Let's stop there for a moment. I really mean that the future remains open. Not many people realize that. They are too stuck in their fear or their thoughts or their anxiety about the future. There will be a war, second Trump, whatever the case might be. That's not true. The future remains open. And when we are doing this kind of exciting work that you, you can do in your um, coastal um, action or thinking about this. What comes to mind without knowing nothing about that actual site is that if you want to try to think long term, on the social side, it might be possible if you have those connections or if you are willing to make those connections um, to start to work with the local First Nations or maybe if there's a Native American reservation. These indigenous peoples are often the ones that have the long-term memory and the view of ecosystem change. Simply because of place names, they may be able to convey oral histories of a change over a long time also to the future. So it doesn't hurt to have good relations with Aboriginal peoples of your area. Actually, you can decolonize or you can form new realities doing that. But that doesn't really answer on the nitty gritty of how do you create or try to work with Andrew Wild sites that will be lasting. Of course, some overall rules like what we can see also in Perino 2019 uh, come to mind. One is that how, how do you secure the land title or the fact that this site will be left at minimum disturbance, at least on the early part? You can have a park or you can have a site or you can have a coastal dynamic area, but you still need some safeguard elements in place that there won't be a hotel or whatever army base or whatever there in, in 10 years. So you have to think about who owns the land or the ocean coast. How do you safeguard that? And how do you, when you make a plan, who will listen? Is it the municipality, the county, the state, and so on and so on. And in the world of evil, uh, action of money, land purchase is sometimes the way to go. I hate money myself and I don't like the fact that snow change has to buy land. It's not a very happy thing to own lots of land because you also will then be re responsible for those lands. But uh, in this world where we are now and in this system, sometimes land purchases buy a foundation or yourself or the, the entities on the ground might be the tactical choice 
to secure land tenure and their safety oversight. Um, and then leaving, leaving it to the natural forces and cycles. And sometimes we fail. We have to also embrace the fact that uh, despite our great minded ideas of a comeback or uh, healing the earth and kumbaya and so on and so on, in the real world, we may fail. Or nature decides that it's over and something else will be there. And I'm mostly reminded by that when I listen to your fact that you might, might have a site on the coast. Because the coasts are, of course, in the littoral zone and all the way to the tidal areas and so on. They are one of the most profound and changing and shifting sites that we will have because of sea, sea level rise, changes in ocean currents um, and, and the species on the move. So there's a lot of species that are now, actually there's a large species redistribution going on on the planetary scale. So many of our conservation areas that were founded to protect a plant or insect or animal will be shifting and they will become new. So change is our only compass. There's nothing we know about the future or not much except that time and space, more time and more space you can buy for any ecosystem or, or whether it's next to an urban area or not, uh, will probably be your best bet in demonstrating on the short term and then on the long term, the, the uh, gains and values of what might come back. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful answer. Any other questions? They are asleep by now. <laughs> I think it's getting close to your bedtime, Tara. <laughs> I think I, well, I have a question maybe while some of the people are still thinking. Um, I'm curious of your kind of definition or differentiation between rewilding and just ecosystem restoration and how that might that thinking might play into like a project such as Pleistocene Park um, in, in <laughs> Liberia. With the Zemos. Nikolai and Sergei, uh, yeah. So for the, for, I don't know if all the students know and all the participants, but there, there's a conversation in, uh, and Matthew put it to the chat, but the, there's a conversation in Northeastern Siberia about a place to see in park where um, Soviet and Russian scientists are working on this remote science station to come bring back grasslands and, and uh, change the tundra um, as a solution to climate change and how snow uh, splinters sunlight and, and uh, uh, trying to slow down the permafrost melt and so on. It's actually one of the core areas of snow change. There are many member communities of the nomadic Chukchi and Yukagir that are smack in the middle of uh, Zimov's uh, Pleistocene Park area. So I have been there many times and I know the fellows. Well, but that doesn't answer the question. So what's the difference between rewilding and restoration? Um, well, it, it's a little bit like the saying that uh, the answer depends on who is listening. Um, on, if I would go and meet with Mr. Biden or Bono or some of the world leaders, um, does it really matter if we call it, or as, as uh, Sir David Attenborough said recently, that rewilding is one of the tools that we can take to save the world. Now, both will talk about how nature comes back to a site or um, we are trying to restart a natural ecosystem uh, uh, from certain viewpoints. And restoration and rewilding are often directed, both of them are directed at degraded landscapes. So at least in part, so that you have something that went wrong or was utilized by humans. And then we are trying to bring those values or systems back to life. Um, I would answer this question in short form by saying that the large restoration school that has been there since 19, I don't know, 1950s or whatever in ecological thought follow and it, <clears throat> it's being driven by, by biological sciences and ecology and so on um, has, has been rather mechanistic in, in its worldview. It looks at these ecosystems as 
something that humans will have to continuously manage. We will take out the invasive species. We will have a ranger program that kills the mink or the raccoon dog or whatever the case, and so on and so on. And, and we use very sophisticated planning by humans uh, to make the decisions on what comes back and how for the lack of better term. So it, it's a very planned process and, and a, a complex one where one of the critically important questions in any restoration work that I didn't talk too much about has to do with the baseline. Because nature has never of course been static even in a natural system. So what is the point of, uh, of a return? Where are we trying to go, go back to? Like in the case of Pleistocene Park, they would like to recreate the woolly mammoth uh, ecosystem. So the baseline matters here. Now, rewilding takes a little bit different pathway to those kind of same uh, aims. It's to the extent from day one that we can, we try to embrace natural cycles and trust also the fact that we, do, we don't plan. We will take a site and trust the fact that um, pollinators, plant life, trees and others will come back using nature's own pace, speed, uh, quantity, scale and so on. And uh, it's a world of surprises. As I was talking about Linnunso, the very first site that we started to work with, our <clears throat> main purpose was to control acidic leaches or very acidic discharges from that site. And it was a completely byproduct that it became a bird paradise. There was nothing that we could plan to witness 195 bird species in eight years that have made a comeback. <clears throat> so um, the short answer is that rewilding and restoration are often, they can be synonyms and to large audiences, like who cares? It's restoration of nature and trying to make things better. For the practitioners and for the nuanced schools of thought that can also fight with it, each other and so on and so on, there, there are even schools of thought inside rewilding uh, <laughs> practitioners. Um, it's really how, how much do we trust nature to come back? What's the level of human biomanipulation um, and, and so on and so on. The, one of the reasons why I don't like the Pleistocene Park is that it's a very scientifically and ethically arrogant uh, in trying to recreate, for example, in some steps, and this was on CNN some days ago as well, uh, using genetic money, how is it called? Genetic modification or, or engineering to bring back mammoth or other species that have been lost over time uh, and, uh, and or introduce species in those areas for recolonization where they have never been before. And this is not rewilding. This is human actions on landscapes that are having a very specific man-made aim, man-made baseline and man-made granted noble targets. And, and uh, it's a, uh, maybe one way to conclude is, is to say that if you have a damaged river like the Hudson River in the New York area, and there's a lot of comments on flooding, what happens, how, why are we having so bad, bad flooding? The engineers will come and build a uh, concrete system of irrigation channels and dams to control the water that flows in the Hudson River catchment. And they, they will say, tick the box, safety, no more floods, it's now clear and it's under control. It's all about power and control. And then rewilding, rewilding practitioner might come in and say, why don't we recreate or restore, rewild the wetlands, the natural flow of water in the catchment so that the, the uh, seasonal variation of rains, floods, uh, storing of water upstream and so on will be alleviated by restarting marshlands, wetlands, and, and seeking natural solutions. So that, that's kind of the mindset of how, how do we work? And um, well, I, do, I speak too much, but uh, let me add one more thing, which is that 
I'm not a big fan of the big narratives out there on spiritual landscapes and blah, blah, blah. These are too easily said big words about places by people that don't have, don't have roots or they don't spend enough time on those places to make those statements often. But I'll, I'll give uh, one concession to that by saying that maybe a place will have uh, many characteristics some of which are extremely hard to feel or know without spending years on a landscape, seen and the unseen. And that's why we have to be extremely aware if we are trying to restore and rewild, not to think like engineers, <clears throat> but more like a, a extremely sensitive and multi-sensory engagements with the landscapes and spend time first before we do anything at all and not rush, but think about that Sami dead decaying timber and the three centuries to the future. Okay. Any final questions? All right, well, maybe we'll call it, we'll call it there. Well, thank you so much, Tara, for joining us. And I think that was a really wonderful, um, so presentation sharing of knowledge and obviously very um, sort of an insightful and sort of caring answers. We really appreciate that. But um, thank thank you everyone else for for joining us. I mean, obviously I'll see you guys out at Milton. I wish we could give Tara a round of applause. Maybe we can give her those little. There you go. Thank you. All right, I'll be in touch. Take okay. care. Okay. All the best for the spring. Stay safe. <laughs> Bye.